Good evening, everybody. We come, to, uh, come from uh, the 1960s, which was when that movie was made about penicillin, when there, was, mm, there wasn't much in the drug formulary, but they were very happy to have something that worked so well. And we come now to uh, 50 years later. Our department was, was started in 1964. Uh, and we come to the centerpiece, I think, of our department in terms of research. And uh, you have two of the core of that uh, group here tonight, the, the founder of it really, and uh, co-leader of a team that you're going to hear more about in pharmacoepidemiology. You have their bios, Dr. Sammy Suisa and Dr. Pierre Ernst. I'll say no more than that because I want you to have the full time with them. So welcome Dr. Suisa and Dr. Ernst when you show, when you come later. Thank you, Dr. Henley. Is the microphone on? Am I good? Everyone here? So thank you, and, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, uh, to find out uh, actually what, uh, to find out what I do. I, it was very difficult for me to, to put this presentation together, and it helped me understand what I do every day and why I go to the office every day. So if you, uh, about a month ago, if you read the McGill Reporter, you would see that uh, uh, the Boehringer Ingelheim company uh, wrote a check of $3 million to our dean, Dean Edelman, uh, to create a chair in pharmacoepidemiology, this very long name. What is pharmacoepidemiology? And why would uh, a, a pharmaceutical company give a gift of such uh, an extensive amount to uh, this university or to any university for this particular topic? So when we talk about pharmacoepidemiology, we're talking about drugs. And the, the road to the development of a drug is very long and winding. It looks, in fact, something like this. So it starts with an idea, and you had a very good example with penicillin. So it starts with an idea and a problem. There is a problem, there is a disease, there is a condition, and we start with this idea. And from this idea, we start working, we use the knowledge about biology, we use knowledge about chemistry, and we start developing some compounds. So in, in the road that is going on here, we start developing some compounds. Today, there are extensive computer systems, computer programs and simulations that allow to evaluate millions of these potential compounds uh, with respect to the biology that is known about the condition we're studying. And then eventually you come up with a couple of potential compounds that you start testing in animals. So as we saw with the penicillin example, you start giving this to animals to see whether, in fact, it potentially works, but also to look for toxicity. We are, look, we are always concerned about giving something to humans that may eventually be toxic. And eventually, as we pass these, uh, uh, these uh, different tests, we go to human beings and uh, uh, slowly with small groups of patients, if we have passed the toxicity test, uh, the drugs are given to small groups of patients which are called these phase one trials right here, phase one trials. Then we go to phase two trials which include more uh, patients. Again, we have passed the toxicity tests. And finally, we go to the very large phase three trials. If the drug has passed all of these tests, we go to phase three trials where we evaluate whether the drug is safe and whether the drug is effective. Once we have all of this, uh, the developer of the drug will go to an agency like the FDA or in Canada, Health Canada. Uh, they will go to the European Medicines Agency with tons of data on all of these experiments that they ran to be able to get the drug approved for marketing. You would like the drug to be used, but before it is used, it has to receive approval by this agency in the US FDA in Canada, Health Canada. Once that is done and approval is given, the drug then goes on the market. Physicians can prescribe it and patients can actually use it. 
One thing that you notice about this road is that at the end of the road, the road seems to stop. It seems that uh, there is nothing beyond that, but in fact, there is a lot beyond that because this is where the drug is actually going to be used in the real world, and it's going to be prescribed and will be used by patients. And this is where we have stories. We have good stories, we have bad stories, and we have ugly stories about what goes on at the end of this road. So I will be sharing with you four of these stories. One is a story that McGill has been involved in very extensively, asthma medications. Uh, another, uh, these are all st uh, stories that we have be all been involved in extensively. The painkiller Viox, uh, disease, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease medications, and therapy for menopause. These are four examples of stories that I would like to share with you. And at the end of the talk, uh, Dr. Ernst will talk about a new initiative in Canada, uh, CNODES, the Canadian Network for Observational Drug Effect Studies, and he will introduce you to this new initiative in drug safety. So the asthma story. How many people have asthma here? How many people know people with asthma? See, this, I see a lot of hands. Even though it's dark from my end here, I see a lot of hands. So asthma is, in fact, one of the common diseases. So what is asthma? Uh, it's a disease of the lung where, uh, as we see from the left side, we have airways in the lung that will uh, convert, uh, bring oxygen uh, to the blood. And these airways are very open. Normally, they should be open like this. but with asthma, they, the, these airways become constricted, they become clog, clogged up, and as a result of that, it becomes very difficult to breathe and to bring this oxygen to the lung. So medications have been developed to target this, uh, this constriction in the lungs, and the medications are called bronchodilators. They basically dilate the bronchi, the, the airways, they open them up, uh, when uh, they are clogged up, you can open up your airways very quickly with these magic medications. There is another component to the disease, which is the inflammation. So there is an inflammation component, uh, aspect that goes on when this disease is, uh, uh, is, is created. And uh, it, in, in that sense, there is another target. Therefore, inflammation becomes another target for medications. And the other target are... Uh, is, is targeted by other medications, which are anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, they are called inhaled corticosteroids. So these are other medications also inhaled, also given through inhaler, but they target a different aspect of the disease. So these are generally the two classes of drugs that are used primarily to treat this disease. Uh, do you know famous people with asthma? In fact, who is the most famous patient with asthma that we know. We don't know. In fact, that patient, in fact, asthma does not only uh, occur on Earth, but it also occurs <coughs> elsewhere. So, so in fact, this is, uh, this is what asthma feels like. Very difficult, uh, great difficulty in breathing. And these bronchodilators open up these airways and allow you to breathe. They are magical. Now, how do we know, by the way, that I found this out recently, how do we know that Darth Vader actually has asthma? Well, in fact, Hollywood told us that Darth Vader has asthma. And I wanted to share this with you because this is a great tool for diagnosis of asthma. You go to a Hollywood movie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what, okay. Hilarious, everyone. Looks like we got more Lucas hounds here to mock Roddenberry. Congratulations, gentlemen. But I would like to see your Darth Vader take on one Borg drone. We'll see who's laughing best. Right? Darth Vader can put the entire Borg collective in a vice grip with his mind. Uh, Darth Vader has asthma, so uh, name me one Star Trek character with a respiratory disease, because I'm drawing a blank. Name me one Star Wars. So clearly, uh, Hollywood has decided that Darth Vader has asthma, and in Star Trek, no one has asthma. 
So why did we get interested in asthma? Because unlike other diseases, asthma mortality seems to have a very different pattern. Patients die of asthma in, a, in an unpredictable way. So uh, here, for example, you have uh, data from five different countries, New Zealand, Australia, England and Wales, Canada and the USA, and mortality between uh, 1960 and 1994, mortality rates uh, per 100,000 in the population. And you notice that Canada and the US are very low at the bottom and very stable. And this is what we would expect from chronic diseases. But you notice that, especially in New Zealand, some very high elevated uh, mortality uh, uh, occur, mortality epidemics, in fact, they call them epidemics, occurred in the 1970s, 80s, and uh, as well in the 1960s. There seems to be something going on in those countries. And the uh, public health officials of those countries, of course, reacted and uh, conducted studies on what causes these deaths due to asthma. New Zealand, in fact, was the country where this was studied extensively. And uh, so authors have looked at that, and what they found was very surprising. In fact, what they found was published also in The Lancet. By the way, The Lancet is the same journal that published that penicillin study way back in the 19, early 1900s. Well, it published in 1989 in The Lancet, it published this study where it found, in fact, that the, the drug that is supposed to treat the disease and to improve the disease was actually responsible for uh, an increased number of deaths, in, of these deaths due to asthma in, uh, in the country. So what was unusual about that study is that, in fact, the study was conducted in a way that when the patient died, uh, the, 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 the scientists were looking at what medication they were using at that time, at the time of death, uh, and uh, arrived at this conclusion, but based only on information around the time of death, as opposed to looking back uh, at the history of use of medications of the patient. So in fact, uh, the, the first studies in terms of asthma mortality, of explaining these epidemics of asthma mortality, were based on the top, the medications here on the top, which are the bronchodilators. These are medications that are uh, very effective and that open up the airways. Why would patients die if in actually you're opening up airways and you're helping to breathe rather than uh, keeping the airways clogged? This, this did not seem very plausible. So we conducted uh, here at McGill the Saskatchewan study. So the Saskatchewan study, why Saskatchewan? Why the middle of the country? Well, the Saskatchewan study uses data from Saskatchewan. Why does it use data from Saskatchewan? Because Saskatchewan was uh, the only province at the time where medications were covered for everyone in the province under the Health Insurance Act of the province. Whereas in other uh, provinces, only people who are 65 and over uh, and uh, people who may be uh, on social assistance may receive uh, medication coverage. Everyone receives coverage for physician visits. Everyone receives co coverage for hospitalizations. But for medications, Saskatchewan was the only place where we could have data on young people with asthma uh, on their medication use. So in fact, those data are computerized, so any visit to a doctor, any medication that you receive from the pharmacy, any hospitalization, any death certificate, all of that information is computerized, and uh, Dr. Ernst and I uh, visited Saskatchewan on many occasions to conduct this study. So we were able to identify 12,000 patients with asthma, and we were able to look at this question carefully. What did we find? Well, we published this not in the Lancet. We published this, in fact, in the New England Journal of Medicine, along with uh, a, our former chairman, uh, Professor Walter uh, Spitzer. And
go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? So, so in fact, on the way back, on the way back from, uh, from Saskatchewan on many of our trips, uh, Pierre and I thought of this possibility that perhaps they were misused but not used properly. They were simply misused, but we found this to be rather implausible. So Hollywood took that option and they used it. But uh, we, we, we believe that these were actually... Uh, uh, real data, patients were actually overusing these medications, and again, they are very effective medications. Now, what about the other type of medications? What's going on with these other types of medications, the ones that are anti-inflammatory, the ones that uh, reduce the, uh, the inhaled corticosteroids that decrease the amount of inflammation in the airways? So we also looked at this. We went back to Saskatchewan, obtained a new larger cohort of patients, 30,000 patients with asthma, uh, more modern data, more up-to-date data, and looked at the role of inhaled corticosteroids. Are they being used, overused, or perhaps underused uh, in terms of asthma mortality? And we found that, in fact, the patients who use these medications regularly, so if you're using six or seven or eight canisters per, per, uh, per year in this case, then you are using them regularly, your rate of, mortality, of asthma death is very, very, very low. And only the patients who don't use them or who use them or, or who use them just sparingly are the ones who die of asthma. So in fact, the reverse picture is happening here. The underuse of these medications is associated with increased asthma mortality. So at the end of this, we basically had two pictures. We had the picture of uh, beta agonists or uh, bronchodilators that were overused and inhaled corticosteroids that were underused. Only the ones who would use them properly had low asthma mortality, but they were greatly underused. And what we concluded from all of these studies is that, in fact, the reverse picture should be happening. These bronchodilators should be used much less, only sparingly, and the reason for using them much less is that in the picture on the left, all of these asthma deaths should disappear if they are used according to, uh, according to, to uh, 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 treatment guidelines, they should be basically patients should be right about here where there is no more asthma mortality. And similarly, if the use of inhaled corticosteroid increases, then you should be in this part of the curve so that the left part of the curve disappears. So essentially, controlling asthma mortality is done by decreasing bronchodilator use and increasing inhaled corticosteroid use. So this was the message from our set of studies from, uh, that we conducted in asthma. And the question is, did this, does this have an impact around the world? So we actually looked at data. So for example, we looked at data from Japan. We had access to data from Japan. And what we saw was that mortality due to asthma in Japan was about six, uh, six per, uh, per million. In fa oops, sorry. It's, it's about six per million. And we saw that at this point, it became about three. Uh, per million. So it, it was reduced by 50%, and this is the time that inhaled corticosteroid use started to be used, in, uh, it started to increase, that use started to increase in Japan. So there was a clear relationship, asthma mortality is decreased by 50% with use of inhaled corticosteroids. We had a student from Portugal, she brought data from Portugal, and we saw the same pattern. In Portugal, in fact, the death rate was much more dramatic. The decrease in, that, in the death rate was much more dramatic from 40 per uh, million in the population to about 5 per million in the population between 1991 and 2001. So in a 10-year period, and that's the time that inhaled corticosteroid use started to increase in that country. So very, very significant decrease in asthma mortality. In Israel, same thing. Uh, we see that uh, the, the increased sales of inhaled corticosteroids was associated with this decrease in asthma mortality. 
And we can ask, what, have, what about New Zealand? Well, New Zealand is the same picture. New Zealand mortality due to asthma decreased between 1980 and, 19, and 1990, and it was a time that uh, inhaled corticosteroid use started to increase, and it picked up. And today, what do we have today? We have that this picture looks like this. Asthma mortality has now been controlled. We don't have these epidemics anymore because these medications are used properly. So this was my first story of some good, some bad, uh, a bit of ugly, but mostly good and bad about pharmacoepidemiology. So this is how pharmacoepidemiology was able to enter a field and arrive at some real world data knowledge about the use of medications, the misuse of medication, the overuse and the abuse of certain medications, and the underuse of other useful medications. So here, putting it all together, I think we have now accomplished a very significant impact in terms of mortality due to asthma. Second story, the painkiller Vioxx. So do you recognize this? Pain in the knee, pain in the back, uh, joints, uh, everyone has these. And in fact, even the, the strongest, if you see here, even the strongest of us here uh, also sometimes need something for pain. Pain is there. And the pharmaceutical industry, the ones who developed penicillin, in fact, came up with a large number of medications. There are many other classes of drugs, but this class of drugs is called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are anti-inflammatory drugs, but they don't contain steroids, and they were developed. There is all kinds of uh, medications on the market. You probably recognize some of them. However, these medications, and again, pharmacoepidemiology was instrumental in identifying that these medications actually cause uh, problems. They cause problems to the stomach, something like this. So they, they can actually, they can actually uh, uh, cause ulcers that can go deep and actually create holes in your stomach. So the ulcer is uh, some kind of a... Uh, 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 it, 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 it's, it's some kind of an erosion. It's an erosion that occurs in the stomach, and uh, it can actually erode right through and create a, a hole inside the stomach, and bleeding occurs, and bleeding goes out. And as a result, you will need some kind of a surgery that will actually cut out a slice of your a stomach and put it all together where that erosion. So this is a very serious condition, and these are medications for pain. Now, the, the companies identified new targets that could potentially reduce these gastrointestinal bleeds uh, or stomach bleeds that are due to these drugs, and they came up with a new class of medications. So you would look, recognize Vioxx and you will recognize Celebrex, for example, in this new class of medication that has a lower incidence of gastrointestinal complications. And they were very, very popular. So Vioxx, in, uh, that was in 2004, in fact, what, what was found is that, yes, it reduced the incidence of gastrointestinal bleeds, but it actually caused heart problems. It caused uh, some cardiac reactions, acute myocardial infarctions, where patients who were put on these drugs seemed to have more acute myocardial infarction. And this uh, was confirmed in a subsequent study by the company. And as a result, the company uh, removed this drug from the market. So this drug was removed from the market. It had lower gastrointestinal con uh, complications, but it was causing acute myocardial infarctions. So as a, the question for us pharmacoepidemiologists was, well, what about uh, two drugs that are on the market and are still are, st are used, and they are, in fact, the, the second generation of these new agents? So they look like the first ones. They are second generation, but they are acting in the same way. Could they also cause heart attacks, and could they also cause strokes, just like the first generation agents? So these were the questions for us. 
And uh, what happened is that these drugs were very new to the Canadian uh, market, and therefore we actually went to another country where these drugs had already been on the market for a much longer time. So in fact, now we can stop and say, what is pharmacoepidemiology and what is it doing this, in this context? Well, pharmacoepidemiology will study the effects of drugs on disease, so you have already figured this out. Uh, it also needs very large populations because, again, when you have conditions that are one per thousand or one per ten thousand, you need to have very large populations for that. These are rare uh, uh, adverse events. You also need data on medications. As you saw from the Saskatchewan study, we were able to obtain data and, and see that patients were actually using a lot of these medications over a one-year period. So you need to have data on these medications, and you need answers now. We don't want answers in 10 years. We need answers now. If patients are being subjected to some uh, toxic drug, we want to know now, and we want to put a stop to that immediately. So we use existing data. We don't collect data. We don't have time to collect data. We use data that are already existing and preferably computerized medical records so that we can access them very rapidly. So in the, in the case of these second generation NSAIDs uh, or third generation NSAIDs, we actually went to the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, the second generation of these, of these agents were actually there on the market before Canada and patients have already been using them. So this is a, 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 the kind of data that we use, uh, more than a thousand general practices, 10 million patients, uh, data collected in these medical records, computerized medical records from 1990 to now, so you have 25 years of data, and you have data on diagnosis, lab tests, drug prescriptions, hospitalizations, etc. So this is a great resource. The, these are our gold mines, if you wish. And those data are sitting in an office in London. It's on the Thames, in an office on the bank of the Thames. And we're sitting here in Quebec. And the data, in fact, are transferred through the Internet. This is the magic of the technology today. We can actually download data on patients in the UK, download them here in our center at the Jewish General Hospital, and start analyzing them the next day. So we actually uh, published st studies on the first and second generation of these agents. They're called COX-2 inhibitors. And we looked at the risk of acute myocardial infarction that we published in circulation. And we also looked at the risk of stroke that we published in the journal called Stroke. Uh, and what did we find? We found that in the United Kingdom, in fact, there are enough patients who use these second generation COX-2 NSAIDs. And we didn't have data here in Canada, but we had these data that we could actually exploit in another country. And we found that the patients who were using one of them, the Arcoxia, etorecoxib, had a twofold increased risk uh, of uh, myocardial infarction. And the ones who were using Bextra, the other one, Valdicoxib, had a fourfold increased risk of myocardial infarction. So the, the babies of these, of these new agents, uh, the second generation of these new agents, were actually causing the same side effects. And as a result of this, in Canada, for example, uh, Pfizer was asked to withdraw Bextra uh, from the market in Canada. This one was in the market in Canada. The other one was not in the market. In fact, it was being considered by Health Canada for approval. It had reached the end of that road, and it was being, uh, uh, in, in fact, it was being evaluated for approval here and in the USA. And as a result of these, uh, all of these accumulation of studies, uh, the US FDA rejected this painkiller, Arcoxia, which is the successor of, uh, of Vioxx. So, so again, pharmacoepidemiology was quite instrumental in uh, arriving at these data, and the, the, the worldwide collaboration that we have here, that means being able to use data from countries where the drug is already on the market for a while, compared to our country, which is the, the drug is not yet on the market, and vice versa. We do studies on drugs as well that uh, other countries are able to use. Uh, th the third story, Parkinson's disease medications. Does anyone know 
uh, of very famous patients with Parkinson's. There are, in fact, two very famous ones. Yeah, the, the, uh, he, you, I sting like a butterfly, or what was it? I sting like a bee. In fact, Mohammed Ali, Mohammed Ali is one of them. And uh, I forget the uh, Fox, Michael J. Fox, that's it, Michael J. Fox, are two of the very famous uh, people who have Parkinson's disease. And it's amazing because you see Michael J. Fox uh, playing these movies where he was basically an acrobat. He would do all these uh, pirouettes uh, on his uh, Back to the Future movies. And uh, Mohamed Ali was uh, basically flying like a butterfly and, and stinging like a bee. And today they are, they are disabilitated completely due to this nasty disease, Parkinson's disease. They don't walk the same way, they don't uh, talk the same way, and it is quite unfortunate. So there are medications to control the symptoms of this disease. Uh, these medications are called dopamine agonists. It's a class of medication. Now, these, uh, the, the name dopamine agonist basically makes us feel that this is one single class of medications, and basically all, uh, all members of that class we think are created equal. And they are all dopamine agonists, they all affect uh, dopamine in the same way. However, and this is, I learned that from one of my uh, brilliant pharmacology uh, student, in fact, they have also different side effects. They could have different side effects. And the question is, could they, could they actually harm heart valves? So we're not talking about the brain anymore. This is a neurological disease. They could actually uh, affect the valves of the heart. How could this be? Well, in fact, uh, there were some spontaneous reports that were published in the Lancet, again, in that, uh, that said that identified two patients who had been put on, the, on, on two of these drugs. And uh, they immediately, their heart, heart valves started to go nuts. And they needed a uh, rapid... Uh, uh, surgery to repair this, this problem. So, so this was published in, in the literature, but the question is, is this real or is it just a, a, just a random coincidence that the uh, patient starts on this drug and ha has a valve problem? They could have had it without the drug. So this is coincidence, and this is where pharmacoepidemiology comes in. Is it a coincidence, or if we look at it in the population, what happens? So we actually use, this is a, a publication that we had, uh, Edel Trout Garbe is that bright, uh, she was a student here with us, and she's that uh, brilliant pharmacologist who actually was able to uh, uncover these potential effects. And we used here, again, that UK data. We went to the UK. We had data from the UK because we had enough patients there, in fact, 11,000 patients with Parkinson's, and we identified 31 patients who had cardiac valve regurgitation when they were using these treatments. And what we found was, we, in fact, we found that we confirmed that those two drugs that were, that were mentioned in the Lancet in terms of those two patients that had uh, cardiac valve uh, regurgitation were in fact associated, that use was associated with that risk. In fact, the risk was very high. It was five times as high or seven times as high depending on which of the agents. So these were very high risks. They were real. It was not a coincidence that those two cases were reported. These effects are clearly very real. And as a result of this study, in fact, the FDA actually pulled uh, one of the drugs from the market. The other one was not on the market in the USA at the time. So the FDA immediately uh, pulled this drug from the market. A seven-fold increase in risk is uh, much too high to be acceptable, especially when you have other medications that do not affect heart valves in this way and that provide the same benefit in terms of dopamine. Story number four, menopausal hormone therapy. So HRT, so this is, uh, so we're going from young people with asthma to a different age here, but this is at the time of menopause and, and post-menopause as well. Menopause is a, a very, uh, I mean, women who have that age will recognize this. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a condition that uh, is quite, uh, uh, on, quite, uh, 
uh, how, how I would say, uncomfortable for, for the woman at that age. So hot flashes, uh, night sweats, irregular periods, loss of libido, uh, vaginal dryness. These are things that a woman is not used to. And then suddenly these things seem to happen all at the same time. But at the same time, you, you also have uh, Broadway musicals that uh, uh, make fun of everything, right? So they make fun of these conditions as well. I'll let you read a little bit. So I, I had to have some Canadian content, and that's why I, I put the, our, our, our friends, the Inuit. Uh. Okay. And there, there are some treatments. There are some treatments for this. Your, your igloo doesn't need to melt. There are some treatments. You can have them in a latte. That's what it seems like here. But of course, these treatments have side effects, always. Treatments will have side effects. So yes, they will control your hot flashes, but they will have side effects. And because we are starting November, I had to put the, the, the hairy side effect at the bottom here. This is uh, simply uh, for, for my November uh, tribute. So one study came up in 2002, and it was what we call a large randomized control trial. This is a trial, basically an experiment that is conducted in a population, very large population, very large study. And it looked at one of these agents, estrogen plus progestin. In fact, it looked at this one. It's called Prempro. This, is, this was the very famous brand. And uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, this, is, uh, this one was developed. These estrogens were, are, are developed, are, are obtained from uh, the urine of uh, pregnant mares. So this is, uh, this is uh, I, we would call it a natural product. This is, this is uh, 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 and in fact, Canada was very instrumental. This was developed in Europe, but it was very instrumental because of the large number of uh, horses that we have and the types of horses that we have here in Canada that contributed to, uh, to this uh, uh, to the development of this drug. So this drug is based on, on uh, as we said, equine uh, urine. Uh, yet, if you looked at the news reports, because this, the, the, this study actually found, uh, looked at many outcomes, many side effects. One of them was breast cancer. And it found that the women who were given this combination therapy had a slight increased risk in breast cancer. So what's interesting is how the media communicates this to you. So here, Sky News, for example, says studied links HRT to breast cancer. But look at the picture. Look at what they're showing you. They're showing you some other uh, hormone replacement therapy. In fact, the one that was studied is this one. But the one that is shown is another, and it's another formulation because this is a patch formulation. So the patch is not an oral pill that you take and that goes through your, your liver, for example. This one will go, the patch will go directly through the skin and will bypass liver and other uh, organs as well. So these are two different entities, yet the media is telling you, watch out, these are associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. But the study, looked only at one kind of pill. There are many treatments. There is, as we said, the patch, uh, but there are also some synthetic pills. So the pills that are done in the lab uh, to replicate exactly what the hormone that is missing is. So what about all of these? What can we say about all of these? Well, that study cannot tell us anything about all of these. It can only tell us about the drugs on the left here because that's all that was studied. And these are sufficiently different that we can expect that maybe the effects are different. So we actually studied that. We looked at this question. We went to the United Kingdom again where we, where we were able to identify a cohort of half a million women from the UK. This is the, the power of these databases. You can identify 500,000 women followed over a long period of time and in, the, in that age group, looking at that age group, who are susceptible to use these agents. We found that the equine-based formulation, the one that was studied in the trial, 
had an elevated risk of breast cancer. So we confirmed that result using this cohort of a half a million women. What we found also is that the synthetic formulations have no increased risk of breast cancer. And the patch version as well, no increased risk. So in fact, pharmacoepidemiology here is able to take a message uh, about a specific drug that is conducted in what we call randomized control trial and is able to go out and identify users of other agents and look at these side effects. The, uh, what we also looked at, and this was the, the, the question of stroke here was also a very hot question. So we looked at stroke and the patch. Patch is, is uh, the transdermal uh, uh, treatment uh, was also very favored. It's the one that was shown to you in the Sky News uh, report. And the question is, wh what does it do in terms of risk of stroke? And we found here, again, that the oral routes were associated with an increased risk of stroke. This is what uh, the other uh, studies had, had found, so we know that. But what about the patch? Well, in the patch, we found that at low doses, the patch with low doses has zero increased risk of stroke. It is completely safe. And this was good news for women who need to control these hot flashes uh, and clearly are afraid of now the entire class, but we're saying you have to be careful. All, not all of these agents are created equal, have the same effects. So this was uh, picked up by uh, uh, the media, and uh, uh, the hormone patch may be safer uh, for women. Uh, hormone replacement uh, patches safer than pills in terms of stroke risk. So this was, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a study that uh, actually made a lot of noise. It was comforting for women who needed these kind of treatments and who were uh, scared to death from uh, the, the media reports about all hormone replacement therapy. But I think that this study was probably one of uh, the highest, uh, one of my highest achievements in, uh, and, and the reason it was one of my highest achievements is that the study was picked up by this magazine. Does, any know, does anyone know about, I never heard of this magazine. It's the magazine of women, uh, for women of style and substance. I, I don't know how to interpret that, but uh, uh, I, I like them very much. And the reason I like them very much is that in 2010, they had the best health advice of 2010. And our study, in fact, was number one. So in 2010, this study was in fact good news. And this is the thing, it was, it was good news. It, instead of the bad news of having a, a certain type of pill with a risk, we have here a, a good news uh, uh, report that you, some formulation can actually do the job and not uh, induce any new risk. So right now, uh, so I'm done with my four stories and I would like to invite Dr. Ernst to talk about So uh, welcome, I'll be relatively brief and we'll have time for questions afterwards. I'd like to tell you a little bit about an initiative, uh, CNOS, if I can figure out how this works, uh, that the government uh, actually took some action to try to get better data on drug safety and developed something called the Drug Safety and Effectiveness Network, of which we're part, and when we're part of a group that, I, that does research on drug safety mainly. Uh, so what's the uh, Canadian Network for Observational Drug Effect Studies? So it's a network of Canadian researchers using linked administrative data in seven provinces and the CPRD that Sammy showed you, which is the, in the UK, as well as some US data called MarketScan. And what do we mean by linked administrative data? We're looking at information that's collected routinely every time you see a doctor, uh, go to a hospital, or fill a prescription. Uh, these data are available to researchers. You're going to have to go through quite a few hoops to get it, but they are available to researchers in an anonymized form, so we can never identify uh, the people who saw their doctor or had these medications. And all the requests are, are referred to an ethics committee, and in Quebec they pass the Commission de l'accès à l'information. 
So what is the goal of CNODES is to provide timely responses to queries regarding drug safety and effectiveness. We try to provide information on the safety of medications used in the general population once a drug is approved and prescribed. So this is the structure of CNOs. I don't expect you to really see this, but the important thing you should know is there's Sammy Suisse's on top. <laughs> okay. But the one thing I did want to say is that we do have, for example, uh, we do have different teams. We try to develop methods to develop new methods to study the safety of medications. Uh, we try to improve the databases across the country that we use. We try to train the next generation of pharmacoepidemiologists. And we have a knowledge translation team which actually tries to get our results out there. And these are, then we have somebody that represents each database. Okay. So what we're trying, what we're actually doing here is we're doing studies in different places. And each study by itself may not have a sufficient number of people or sufficient number of people taking a medication to be, provide an answer to our question as to drug safety. And what we do is we combine all these individual studies here into one combined estimate of effect, which because of the much larger population is much more accurate. I'm going to give you one example, and the reason I wanted to give you an example on statins is because it's thought that by the year 2020, one billion people worldwide will be taking statins, which is a lot of people and a lot of profits for the drug companies. Um, and a lot of people, I won't ask who's on statins, I don't want to embarrass you, uh, but uh, it's certain that these drugs uh, have efficacy for preventing heart attacks uh, if you've already had a heart attack or if you have coronary artery disease. And there are newer statins that are high potency statins that are prescribed more and more, and we wanted to look at some of their adverse effects. There had been some reports from clinical trials that statins may increase your risk of diabetes, but again, this was done in a clinical trial population, not in a general population of patients, and also the numbers were insufficient to be sure. So this is a paper that appeared in the BMJ, and this is the team I just need to acknowledge here because, whoops, uh, they did the work, and Colin Dorthmuth from University of British Columbia was the lead author. Okay. So as I said, in the clinical trials carried out for drug approval, the possibility was raised as to whether the high-potency formulations, these are the newer drugs like Crestor or the high-dose Lipitors, as to whether the high-potency formulations might increase the risk of developing diabetes. As I said, the trials had insufficient information, and the risk might be greater in a general population of patients. When clinical trials are being done, these are people who are relatively healthy, often have only one medical problem. When the general population is taking medications, they often are taking several med different types of medications and may have several different medical problems. Okay. So these are the results, and I'll try to... Just again, all I want you to see here is that we have different studies. For example, there's one study carried out in Alberta, and everybody is using the same protocol. So we have one study carried out in Alberta, one carried out in the UK, one in Manitoba. And what we, you can see is actually the results in the individual studies are overall quite different, especially for the small centers, because they really don't have enough cases uh, to be able to find cases of diabetes to be able to show an effect. But when we combine all these studies together, what we can see, we can conclude if these studies are similar, are done in the same way that there's a 15% increase on average of risk of diabetes when comparing the new higher potency statins to the lower potency statins. And I just wanted to show you the conclusion uh, from the paper, and I put it up there because I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. But I think it's a, type, it's a conclusion that's quite conservative, and it's conservative because statins are very popular, and uh, people, they have clearly been shown to have benefit in certain populations. So the conclusion of the paper is that we found modest evidence that there is a harmful association between statin potency and new diabetes in patients treated for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And the advice to physicians is they should consider our study results when choosing between lower potency and higher potency statins in secondary prevention patients. When we're talking about secondary prevention, we're talking about patients who are already known to have coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease. They've had a myocardial infarction. 
because these patients, the, there is a clear benefit of statin, but bearing in mind that head-to-head -head randomized trials of higher potency versus lower potency statins have not shown a reduction in, pre in prevention patients with stable disease. So the conclusion of the study on statins is that, yes, statins are certainly useful for patients who already have coronary disease, but whether or not we should be using the higher potency statins is, remains open to debate. And I think this is important considering the number of people on statins and the fact that certainly the high-dose statins are being prescribed more and more. Okay, so thank you, and I think we're open for questions, Sammy. in Minimed is that they write the questions out and pass them down using the volunteers and then we'll, we'll uh, answer them from there. Okay, so perhaps yeah, I stand so up you here. Should, you should stand over there. So while, can I speak now? Yeah. So while we are uh, collecting questions, I think uh, Dr. Hanley is identifying the very tough ones. He doesn't want to give us the easy ones. Uh, so I invite all of you uh, to visit our CNOTE site and, of course, to do the usual Canadian thing, is to send an email to the Minister of Health, the Federal Minister of Health in Ottawa, and tell them how much you love CNOTE's and how important this uh, project is for the safety of Canadians, for the, for the health of Canadians, and to protect the safety of Canadians. So you are invited to do that, and you can even do it right now on your iPhone or so. I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have Minister Ambrose's uh, uh, email address, but... Uh, We're going to be here a while, Sammy. <laughs> We're going to be here a while. To start with that. So the, the question, and Pierre, maybe come. So the question, Pierre, why did New Zealand have higher spikes of mortality before corticosteroid used compared to other countries? Um, it's a very controversial topic. Uh, I'll give you my take on it, which the people from New Zealand might not agree with. I can give you several people who would not agree with my take on it. Uh, there was really a very substantial abuse of these inhalers in New Zealand. Um, part of it was due to their Aboriginal population that had quite poor access to medical care. Uh, and I think that's the main reason, and there was underuse of inhaled corticosteroids. The spikes happened in, not, in several English-speaking countries, so it happened in New Zealand, but it also happened in Australia and the UK. Now, what the people from New Zealand will tell you is that they did not have, that the countries where there wasn't a spike, like Canada and the U.S., did not have access to Barotech, or less, less access to Barotech, which was the second inhaler that came to the market, it was formulated at twice, at least twice the effective dose. So it probably gave you too much relief, allowing you to stay at home for too long instead of going to the emergency room. Uh, thank you. I, I have to tell you that, in fact, uh, Pierre Ernst is the world expert in asthma, and he knows this study very, very well. So I'm glad he answered this question. But well, there's another one for you. That sounds there's a statin question. I never prescribe statins, and I wouldn't take one, so I admit to a bias here. Uh, define high-potency statins. So the high-potency statins are statins that lower your cholesterol by a certain amount, uh, but they're considered to be uh, rosuvastatin, which is the newest one, which is Crestor, and the other one is atorvastatin, which is high-dose Lipitor which is 20 milligrams or more Lipitor, and then there's Simvastatin, and I forget what the trade name for that, but it's more than 40 milligrams of that. Those are considered the high-potency statins and probably have the major part of the market. Probably we should say 
talk to your doctor, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're the cox two <laughs> were the cox two drugs also withdrawn in England after the study, and the answer is I don't know. I cannot say, uh, but I believe that uh, some. In fact, there are some first generation cox two drugs that are still on the market here in Canada as well, and uh, so so the. Uh, Vioxx was, re was removed from the market by the company, not by the FDA. So the company chose to remove this drug from the market, and the other competitor had basically chose not to do that. So uh, I guess what the agencies in that context uh, concluded is that there is a small risk, but there is also a benefit, and the, the way of uh, risk versus benefit should be done by the prescribing physician. So the answer is I don't know in the UK what the status of these drugs are. I get to go back to asthma, thank you, something I know something about. Why does using bronchodilators a lot kill you? And I, I said it's really, it's overuse. It's not the bronchodilator kills you. What kills you is the fact that you use the bronchodilator to keep your six cats at home. Uh, and not go to the emergency room when you should, and not use your inhaled corticosteroids because you're scared of steroids and they don't give you immediate relief. So you're left using a drug that opens the airways but does not treat the underlying problem. And if you do that long enough, your lung function will get progressively low enough without you noticing that you will actually fall down and die. And it's, I remember a headline saying, uh, broken door in ambulance kills asthma patient because the ambulance door wouldn't open. That patient should have never needed an ambulance. That's not the ambulance door that killed the patient. It's the lack of adequate treatment. Mm -hmm. I got one more then if you want. Okay, are there any over-the-counter drugs that contain steroids? Well, you can get topical steroids out of cortisone 1%, I think. There are no asthma inhalers containing steroids that are over the market. You can get a real deadly inhaler over the market, which is an ephedrine type inhaler. Now that's, that's, uh, that's a very potent, dangerous bronchodilator. That is available over the counter. So I have a question. Do you think Canadians report enough adverse events to pharmaceutical companies and Health Canada, which will help us have a better understanding of drug safety? Uh, I, I don't think, in fact, uh, patients report them, maybe via their physician, and, uh, and then the physician actually reports that to Health Canada, and uh, it gets reported to the pharmaceutical company as well. Uh, but maybe uh, having uh, patients uh, interact as well would be a, a uh, good uh, initiative. In fact, uh, the example of the dopamine agonists and the valvular uh, regurgitation, the, the valve regurgitation, were spontaneous reports that a physician observed in their patient. Uh, the patient uh, uh, had this nasty reaction, and they were reported in the literature. And that's how we were able to go forward and conduct this study. Without these two reports, we would have never had the idea to conduct this study. So I have another steroid question. They're my favorite. So uh, what about steroid treatment long term? I think you have to distinguish oral corticosteroids, which have major adverse effects, and we only use in very serious diseases and for as short term as possible. The inhaled corticosteroids at the doses most patients with asthma need have no side effects. Uh, there are exceptions. If you have very severe asthma and require very high doses of inhaled steroids, there are side effects, but they're substantially less than the oral steroids you would require if you weren't taking these inhaled corticosteroids. That's okay. Sorry. Why? More asthma? Why? Maybe no, more. General, general question. You got one. So I, I can look at this one. So Dr. Suisa, how many publications on drugs and their safety have you released? Has this caused a lot to be taken off the market? Thank you. So we, uh, we publish extensively a large number of, of, of studies. And as you saw, our publications now include a combination of studies from different databases, so the CNODES group, for example. But uh, uh, these studies will not often get a drug off the market. I mean, the, the examples I, I gave you were uh, quite unique examples. The studies that we conduct will identify side effects, and often 
what, what happens is these side effects will end up in the label. So when, you hear, when you're in the United States and you hear commercials about drugs, the commercial lasts 30 seconds. The first 10 seconds about the, are about the good things, and then the last 20 seconds are that list of the, co the drug may cause uh, uh, nausea, headache, blah, blah, blah. So it gets added to this list, basically. So a lot of the research that we do will uh, identify side effects uh, that in the balance of risk and benefit should not remove the drug from the market. There is a good benefit with the drug, but to get to be aware of this potential side effect and the physicians would know what to do with that side effect. So for example, high dose statins and diabetes, for example, that you have to be aware of this in uh, prescribing such uh, drugs to your patients. So why are drugs that are considered dangerous and deadly still sold on the market? Um, often because they're older drugs uh, and they may, but also more often they may be dangerous for most patients. They may actually be good for a minority of patients. Not all patients are the same, so they may still have a useful purpose. Um, I think that's probably the main reason we have to remember that not everybody's the same and we do need some choices. And also some people have such some very severe life-threatening diseases. For example, think of chemotherapy. I mean, chemotherapeutic drugs are deadly. Uh, but however, they save lives. So there's always the balance between risk and benefit, and it's the responsibility of a doctor and a patient together to actually discuss this balance. Mm. So this is interesting. This is with the advancement of pharmacogenomic testing. So this is basically looking at what you look like, what does your gene look like. Uh, and given the, their exorbitant cost, are randomized control trials, clinical trials, a thing of the past? Uh, my answer is definitely no. I think the randomized control trial is here to stay. It is uh, one of the uh, most powerful tools in, uh, in, in scientific research, especially in pharmacological research. So it definitely will be here to stay. But these are complementary methods. So uh, within a trial to uh, find out more about the gene, to find out uh, where, for example, uh, a drug may be more beneficial in a subgroup of patients versus another group of patients. So it will complement uh, information from trials, just like the observational studies that we showed you are complementary uh, to provide additional information on the effects of drugs. So the answer is no. I think we'll just be doing more research to know more and better things about the drugs that people take. I'll let that, you might try that. So what alerts you f to a specific drug that should be researched due to anecdotal evidence or something else? Uh, often there's a signal, uh, spontaneous reporting, uh, pharmacovigilance, which is there are programs that try to trace adverse effects of medications. Um, and often it's uh, something that happens in a clinical trial. It, it's what there's a sort of a suspicion of, oh, may there appear to be a bit of excess of pneumonia in this group of patients with COPD treated with this medication. But they have, so that says, well, maybe we need to look at that in a larger population. So I think that's how we get to our questions. So this is about a specific drug for diabetes, Avandia. Uh, and Diamicron. And, uh, uh, and their side effects, are they still in the market? I know that Avandia was removed from the market because it had these cardiac side effects. Uh, and eventually it, it returned eventually to the market under very specific conditions. I cannot say, uh, since I do not, we do not prescribe them, I do not know whether in Canada they are available or not, but they have returned to certain markets, again, under certain conditions. Yeah, I don't know which one Diamicron is, no. or I don't, I'm not good with trade names. Um, a question, any data concerning increased rate of asthma in New York City after 9-11? Mm. Uh, was there use of bronchodilators? Actually, what's been after 9-11 is not asthma, really. There's been all sorts of respiratory conditions resembling more an inflammatory disease like sarcoidosis, which is due to inflammation, a lot of the particulate there. Not sure there was, there was an excess of asthma there, but I uh, have to say that I'm not sure about that. So on average, how much longer does the process of creating a drug and putting it on the market take if it was not yet tested elsewhere? So this is a process that takes about 10 years. 
there is the, th those first uh, two, three years to identify the potential uh, products, then the, as we said, the testing in animals, testing in human beings, getting all of these results out from randomized trials takes about 10 years and apparently costs about a billion dollars. So for a drug, a successful drug that came on the market, about a billion dollars were spent on research to uh, bring this drug to market. And from this point on, uh, the patent is protected for a certain number of years that varies from one country to the other, and that's why these drugs are expensive uh, when they are sold. Last week, New York Times reported a relationship between asthma and low levels of vitamin D. Has any further information come out? So there's been uh, reports of every disease and low vitamin D. Uh, uh, I think this is, uh, is not going to pan out to anything. I can tell you that studies of vitamin D replacement in asthma have been totally negative. So I think there's something associated with low vitamin D that might be associated with other diseases. I don't think vitamin D is the answer, I'm afraid. Who reads the New York Times? <laughs> so in, in receiving such large grants, how do you assure your independence? So I, I think this, this is a, a, a good question, but we are our work, so our money is coming from the federal government. The federal government gave us a large amount of money to, uh, to create C nodes. And uh, we are a completely independent group in answering questions of importance to Health Canada. So uh, as such, we, we keep our independence uh, complete. With respect to uh, the, the pharmacoepidemiology, the chair in pharmacoepidemiology, uh, we have uh, lawyers at McGill that I think spent, what, two, two to three years negotiating with the lawyers of the ones who are writing this $3 million check for the chair to make sure that independence is completely protected uh, with this chair. So our, our chairman is here. He was part of that negotiation, and he saw how the lawyers actually fought it out. But it, uh, McGill, by, by rules, has to uh, have a complete uh, independence from uh, such monies, and this, this is attained. So we have... We have mechanisms to protect this. An interesting epidemiological question. How can pharmacoepidemiology avoid deaths caused by medications that have an impact in the long term? Um, well, we, our databases that we use, for example, uh, when we use the CPRD databases, we have data from the early 90s. Uh, with the Quebec data has been available. We've used Quebec data as far back as the mid-80s. So actually, if you have a question, if the medications were available, we can follow up patients for 30 years. Obviously, if the medication is only available for the last two years and their long-term effects, uh, it'll be the next generation. So explain the broad harvesting of metadata versus confidentiality problems. So this is clearly an issue because uh, we are currently doing studies using the Quebec databases, for example, and some of you may be in our studies. Uh, and the, the, the idea here is that for the benefit of the population, uh, the use of this data has been deemed to be uh, necessary to advance knowledge but of course, there are many safeguards. So for example, there is, we have no name. We don't have the exact birth date of the person. So it's almost impossible to identify who this person is. We are given a limited amount of information on each patient, but certainly impossible to identify personally who that individual is. So with that context, with those safeguards, and uh, the Commission d'accès à l'information that uh, Dr. Ernst spoke about, uh, and other ethics committees, we have uh, developed the safeguards to be able to use these data and protect the confidentiality of uh, patients. I want to answer this one. How does the perks affect the objectivity of the results of the research? Um, I can tell you how I deal with that very simply. I have no, no dealings at all with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, my perks would come from McGill University as being a full-time professor and getting a salary there. Whatever I do, because I'm tenured, they basically can't stop my salary until I'm 65, <laughs> and I can stop doing research on drugs tomorrow and they can't do a thing about it. So I can keep the perks whatever I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what is a bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Is it safe? The answer is, I don't know, I don't know. What are the long-term effects of statins? How long can a person yo, yo, <laughs> take without any side effects? Okay, so the common of side effects are, are of statins are actually myalgias or joint pains. And one of my beefs about statins, I, I hear all sorts of people say, geez, you know, every time I take this statin, I can't run anymore because, you know, I have pain everywhere after I run. So exercising five minutes a day reduces your risk of a myocardial infarction by 40%. So if a statin is not allowing you to exercise five minutes a day, I don't think it's a good drug for you. Um, so how long can you take without? Some people can take them their whole lives with no side effects. The risks we're talking about, increased diabetes, we did a study on increased acute kidney injury, are small increases in side effects. But when we calculate something number needed to treat, if you have never had a heart attack and you have no known heart disease, over a thousand people have to take a statin for 10 years to prevent one heart attack. That's a lot of people taking statins. It's very different if you've been to the hospital and you had a heart attack and you're trying to prevent a second one. However, if you continue smoking, your risk of having a second heart attack is increased tenfold, so that should be number one. You can reduce by 40% by exercising five minutes a day. And then you probably should take a statin. Just find one. I would take a low-dose statin in that situation. There we go. So this is you, Jim. Uh, any more questions? Uh, one more statin's question. I just read last week. Oh. Well, I think most diseases are due to multiple causes. There are very few diseases due to one cause. Uh, and cholesterol in your blood, not the cholesterol you eat, but cholesterol in your blood is related to your risk of heart attacks. And therefore, reducing it uh, reduces your risk of a heart attack. Now, the problem is if your risk is one in 10,000 because you exercise every day, you don't smoke, and you're slim, and you have no family history, well, taking a statin, the benefit of taking a statin, you'll never live long enough to find a benefit. And you'd have to treat 5,000 or 10,000 people like that to prevent one heart attack. So, yes, the drugs work, but do we want to treat 10,000 people to prevent one heart attack? I would say no. I, 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 I said one billion people is projected... The Journal of American Medical Association project one billion people in 2020 on a stat. Well, on that very topic, let's come to a small bit of a quiz uh, to see how far we've gotten. Um, I'm going to show you some of the top sellers here, and you have to guess what they are. And then we'll show you three classic medications or three classic drugs, and you have to figure out on a speed test what they are. This will be a speed test at the end for the three because you've heard about some of them already. But first of all, what are people's get? People can do long division here, right? If we divide 500 million by 30 million, how many is that? Medications per person per... That's about 15 medications per year per person in Canada, right? No, that's across the entire public. If these numbers are right, they're from the IMS, I think, does a survey through the pharmacies, right? Yeah, prescriptions. So prescriptions. They're, yes, they're actually prescriptions. Yeah. So that's about uh, 15 each per year, or about a little more than one per month. So it basically says everybody in Canada, on average, is on a medication, right? If you count these as 15 prescriptions per year, per person, that's one per person per month. So that's the whole story for everybody. 
But I'm curious what you think the top ones are. And it's not like 1964 when all there was was four versions of penicillin. So let me give you, you want to trot out some first? These are prescription drugs now, not over the counter. Birth control. We have a young crowd. Valium? Statins? Centroid? What's that? Okay. Antidepressants? Okay. Well, I'll tell you. Here's the list. So I'm sure you can all find one of your own there. But I want to ask you in a minute what the ordering is. Which one is at the top? Everybody found their own favorite there? <laughs> There's one for everybody here, I'm sure. Okay. Who's going to guess what number one is? Celebrex? No. Coumadin? No. Lipitor is uh, high up there. Crestor that you're talking about, Dr. Ernst, is next. Crestor is one of the statins from AstraZeneca. Lipitor is statins from uh, Pfizer, I think. Then you see a number with APO. I think those are generic. Yep. Teva is generic and APO. I think it's APO, APO, the one from John. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Number four. Nexium was there, like people suggested. What's number seven? Uh, antidepressant. antidepressant, yes. That number eight is a beta blocker. Number nine. ACE inhibitor, sorry. ACE inhibitor. What's number nine? Diuretic, yeah. Clavix, a blood thinner. Atorvostatin, that's the generic version of uh, Lipitor. The next one, I'm not sure what it is. Oh, uh, one of the uh, acid reducers. Ativan sounds like an antidepressant, is it? No. Valium, okay. Yeah. Celebrex is there. Okay. Et cetera, et cetera. And then there's still a lot more to come. I've always said if I was advising my kids what to go into, I would say open a pharmacy. <laughs> okay, so three classic drugs, but this is a speed test now. You really should get these very, very quickly, what the three drugs are. Why do you say that? It seems like lots of the drugs end with the letter N. Come on, who's going to say? Aspirin, that was too easy, right? Yeah. But the reason it uh, is no longer a brand name in some places or a trademark is because of the war reparations with Germany. They lost, they lost the uh, trademark, and it was given to the, the victors of the First World War. That's why some of those have it as a generic. It's still a trademark with Bayer in Canada, according to them. And in Germany. This is all from Wikipedia, so I don't know how safe that is. <laughs> uh, reason in the bottom, colon cancer, slightly protective, I think. Rye syndrome, kids, young kids stay away from taking, or parents stay away from giving it to young kids. Heart disease, protective. And that's the uh, a very, I think you were asked about randomized trials. They're always going to be there when you're looking for benefit. They can't be there when you're looking for harm. Mm -hmm. And this study on the right is the, is the benefit side of the aspirin. Next one. You heard about this already. 
Premarin. Yeah, and the connection is indeed with the McGill Biochemistry Department from the same team that developed with Banting and Best di uh, the insulin drug. It's the same collop that's associated with that. And the last one. Statins, yeah. yeah, statins, and uh, developed or discovered in Japan by somebody who checked through a whole lot of natural products first. Okay, uh, please fill out your evaluations. I'm sure the team will want me to say that and hand them in up top. Next week, uh, Jean-Francois Boivin on epidemics again and epidemiology. And uh, have a good night, and we hope this worked well, and you can see why we say pharmacoepidemiology is the center, one of the centerpieces of our program. So thank you. <laughs>